This workshop is put on by Tempe Water Conservation in partnership with the Tempe Library. I'm Tina Slaver, the Conservation Coordinator, and we also have Nicole Swanson, the City Sustainability Librarian, and tech support today. If anyone experiences any technical issues, we're here to help. I'm checking the email as well as Nicole's phone number has been posted in the live Q&A. So you're welcome to call that number and we'll get you help as soon as possible. This is also being recorded. So this workshop will be posted on our um, city YouTube and linked from the Tempe Water Conservation Workshop page in our video library. Please be sure to submit any questions that you have throughout the presentation using the Q&A feature as well. Those questions come directly to us and if we can answer them immediately with resources, we do so and then uh, we try to save some of those questions to ask during two Q&A sessions during the presentation. Nicole and I will be monitoring your questions and comments in that chat bar, so feel free to send them anytime um, we encourage them. But I'm most excited to introduce to you today our instructor for today's class, Emily Heller, returning from a wonderful presentation virtually last fall. Um, she is a master gardener and farmer, and she's going to be teaching the class today focusing on spring vegetable gardening. And the reason that we're holding this class is that early spring in the desert is the perfect time to plant tomatoes, and a bevy of other delicious homegrown favorites. So you're gonna learn about the vegetables that thrive in the warming weather and how to grow them successfully in your own garden. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Emily and pull up her slides. Tina. Hi, Tina, and thank you so much for inviting me to uh, come back and uh, participate uh, by sharing all these best practices for low desert gardening. And the spring season, is absolutely um, uh, full of excitement. So many things um, we can grow. Um, and the, the practices that we use here in the low desert are a little different. And um, you may have gardened in other places, uh, or you may have a wonderful family that gives you all kinds of gardening tips and helps you with problems. And um, uh, uh, it's great to apply uh, uh, experience um, but I want you to sort of set that previous experience you may have had aside and um, kind of reframe your thinking about gardening in the low desert because it's, it's a little different here. But uh, our presentation today is just a flyover. It is, it's only about an hour and we, it's a very large topic um, with uh, lots of material in it. So my goal for uh, this presentation and for you today is to get the big picture, to get inspired, to uh, want to um, uh, get out there and grow some food and uh, flowers and herbs in your own garden. Uh, but there's no way we'll be able to get to all the nitty gritty. So um, uh, let's, let's begin. By the way, all of those pictures on that first slide are just from my own growing area, and um, they're not doctored in any way, and your garden can look just like that. Okay. One thing I've done for you uh, for this class is I've put together a reference, and yes, it's a handout, but it's my hope that you will um, uh, use this reference as a guide uh, to refer back to, not just for this uh, this year, but maybe in the years to come. And there's a, a good amount of summary information on here, as well as listings of crops and different things to grow and how to grow them. And this document is um, has been provided uh, to you um, uh, uh, through this program, and I believe it's also going to be uh, uh, posted in the in the uh, chat um, where uh, you'll be able to download it if you haven't seen it yet. I would, uh, the one thing that, that this handout is not, is not a slide-by-slide -slide, um, uh, a guide for you to follow along um, at home. It's really meant for you to print it and um, use it and uh, refer back to it. So um, I, I'm gonna show you what the, what's in the handout. So um, this is uh, overview information um, that talks about uh, positioning, where to grow, uh, how to prepare your soil, um, 
plants you might consider growing together, and then how to care for those uh, groups of plants. Um, I have listed, as you can see at the top, food, flowers, and herbs. The ones with an S following the name of the crop means that you grow from seed. They, I have a special category for heat-tolerant greens. I have a category for flowers because offering sources of nectar and pollen in your garden is extremely beneficial and I want to encourage you to grow flowers every, every season. So I've tended, I've grouped here the flowers that require more frequent water and those that are, um, are get along fine and produce flowers with less frequent water. And the herb category is grouped similarly, the ones that need regular, um, more frequent water and the ones that um, do not need as frequent watering. The next um, chart, I think, is probably one of the most useful uh, uh, things in this handout. It's the warm season crop, noted whether it has high uh, demands for um, uh, fertility in the soil, the ideal soil temperature for that seed to germinate, the time frame for planting that seed, if you like growing in containers, the minimum size container that you could grow that crop in, if you're growing multiple plants, which you probably will be doing, the spacing between the plants, and that's an extremely important characteristic of healthy gardens is enough room for plants to grow. And then finally, a listing for what family that crop is included in. And one of the, uh, another component of a healthy garden is uh, a plant that uh, has, uh, is growing in soil that hasn't had a plant from that family in the last three years. So we want to rotate the location of our crops. It's called crop rotation. And in that category where it says family, it looks kind of like a, a lot of Latin with a lot of A's and E's. Just note what family it's in. Don't worry about how to pronounce it correctly. It doesn't matter. Just note the family. And then if you've grown something from that family in that soil, shift gears, shift to another plant family, and you'll, be, you'll have a much healthier soil and healthier garden. All right, there are lots of things that we, uh, reasons why we grow, and of course, for color or to create a, a beautiful green look, to grow herbs, or to improve the quality of our soil. And so what I've done for you is list the crop and um, whether it, would fit under these different categories and perhaps a little bit more of growing information and we're not going to go through all these details um, in the class but again I want you to refer back to it. Um, uh, there is some information in here about um, about maybe how large the plant is or what the flavor is like, um, whether it goes fast, um, or whether it's especially heat tolerant and here is the rest of that document. So the um, uh, you know, it, there are lots of ways that we can use the intense sun and heat to improve our gardens. We don't have to just let our gardens bake, especially once the in most intense heat comes. And if you've planted your warm season garden early, then the plant sort of, um, uh, they go out of business once it gets incredibly hot, and especially if we haven't had a lot of rain. And that may be a time to shift gears and maybe go from growing food to growing crops that will develop the soil. And you'll get some ideas on the screen that I'm showing now for things that you can grow that actually keep the soil active and alive during the most intense part of our summer. At the bottom of this page, you'll see um, uh, some additional references, which I strongly, strongly encourage you to follow up on. The University of Arizona Cooperative Extension has a website where they have dozens of uh, articles and publications. Some of them I've listed right here, and that's what the number refers to after that topic. The vegetable planting calendar is, is document number 1005, and that's for the entire year. Um, and there are just so many wonderful references there. I strongly enc encourage you to become familiar with all of the glorious um, references here. It's based on actual research not just anecdotes, not just somebody had a, a, a good experience if they did X or Y, but research proven methods and instructions. And these are wonderful guideposts. And I have some additional references listed there for you um, to continue your, uh, your search and continue your referring um, uh, to 
additional documents. So uh, flowers I had mentioned, and um, I have a flower reference in here about when to plant. And you'll notice that most of these flowers, the clustering is uh, begins this month, but the biggest clusters are March and then in April. And then you can plant some of these flowers later as, as the spring progresses. But most of these will fare much better, will produce more flowers, nicer flowers, if you can get them going earlier in the spring. And March is really prime time. All right, so let's get going. I had mentioned that gardening is, is quite different here in the low desert. And um, to maybe set aside some of the ex previous experiences you may have gardening elsewhere or maybe helpful well-meaning relatives might be giving you suggestions on how to how to garden here um, and um, we can we can follow the well-founded guidelines that are based on research here in the low desert there's a lot of information out on um, uh, on the internet about how to garden and maybe even how to garden here in the low desert but i want to encourage you to follow the guidelines that are well-founded and not just anecdotal the one of the key Things to remember as we're gardening here, gardening anywhere, there are so many variables that are so beyond our control. Gardening in the low desert has additional challenges and things are different every season and our climate is changing. So we have to make sure that we approach this activity with not only hope and anticipation of a yield, but flexibility when things don't turn out exactly as we had hoped. So the warm season in the low desert, it's a bit of a euphemism, isn't it? Warm season because we can have uh, temperatures over 100 degrees as early as March. We've experienced that before. So it's a catch-all term, but let's think rather than the, whether the term accurately describes our spring, let's think about what the conditions are that, that, uh, that we are going to be dealing with. Of course, the air temperature is increasing and the soil temperature is increasing. The air is extremely dry, oftentimes in the single digits for relative humidity. And air that's that dry is sucking uh, moisture out of, of the plants. There's a differentiation in the, in the, in the atmosphere and the, the, the plants are actually losing moisture at a very high rate, especially as we get into triple digits and dry air. Uh, there is little, if any, rainfall, and we have experienced a La Nina uh, winter season with um, very, not very much rainfall. And the, the, the uh, rainfall chances as we get into spring tend to diminish. Our day length is increasing, which is a wonderful thing for plants. Um, and of course, it increases um, and peaks at uh, the summer solstice in uh, around the third week of June. And our, in, our, our heat is intense and it, we're, we're not really kidding. If, if you're brand new here, um, uh, it really feels pretty oven-like um, as the heat surrounds your body and as the heat surrounds your garden and your individual plants. And normally we get that intense heat by April and May. Uh, it's not just heat, it's the solar radiation, the angle of the, the, the way the light is striking us. Um, it's very harsh. And um, uh, as we get into well into, into summer, then the monsoon, monsoon season um, arrives with increasing moisture in the air and the possibility of rainfall. And the last two summers, we have not had very much rainfall at all in the season. Um, there does tend to be more moisture in the air and that provides a little bit of a relief for some plants um, and uh, it, it is also another season for planting. So the warm season is really most of the year um, and uh, it begins now and lasts all the way through until our October uh, time frame where we uh, begin planting our cool season uh, crops. So um, you know, Mother Nature is demanding our attention to the weather because the weather in February, March is very different than the weather in May and June. Um, of the warm season crops, some will not germinate and be very, uh, very or very happy young plant if it does germinate if the soil is not warm enough and if the air temperature is not warm enough. Okra, sweet potato, hibiscus, sebdorifa, sesame are examples of that. And 
I'm going to refer you back to the handout where I have noted the soil temperature for ideal seed germination. So um, for these crops that um, really like it hot, it might be better to wait until it's a little bit warmer. But all of these um, characteristics of our environment for the warm season, they're different every year. And uh, even though we can take a look at what the averages have been, what the weather is that we can expect, you should expect the unexpected because it really does change. And so how do we deal with that? Well, we can certainly make our plans and figure out what to grow and figure out when to plant. But the a big component of success is really monitoring your conditions. And let's say, for example, the, the weather for the latter two weeks of February were to kind of um, uh, 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 trend downward and we had some cold snaps and we had maybe some chilly rain, um, then you might want to consider waiting until things the, uh, warm up again and um, we give the soil an opportunity to warm up again. Remember, a seed is germinating based on a temperature of the soil that it's in. And if you use transplants, which is absolutely a wonderful way of uh, getting your garden going, then remember, even if uh, the soil is um, a little bit out of the ideal range for that plant, the plant is just not going to be very metabolically active and might not grow very much initially. So monitor the weather. Become a weather nerd. It's really a fun thing. So here we have the warm season. It's a little bit tricky, though, because we have these warm season crops that will not tolerate frost, and they need warm soil and air to grow properly. However, the intense uh, uh, conditions of spring, this heat, intense solar radiation, it just zaps plants. It can sunburn leaves and fruit, and it actually kills pollen. So what do we do? We have strategies that will help us still to get our garden in these fleeting, um, uh, moderate conditions of spring. We plant early, which is right now. And we grow the early maturing varieties. And what does early maturing mean? That means that these are varieties that have um, the characteristic of producing the harvestable item, whether it's the leaf or the fruit, um, uh, uh, earlier than other varieties in that category. So we want to give our garden a chance to yield before it really gets so, so hot that a plant might be alive, but it's just struggling to, uh, to um, um, make, make the food that we want it to grow. So March and April have extreme temperature fluctuations. And how do we help our gardens cope with these ups and downs and uncertainties? We give them as much of an ideal environment as we can, the things that they need the most, because these uh, uh, a stronger plant is a, a plant that is more likely to get through these stresses. A, an intensely stressed plant is much less likely to yield, uh, but even in stressful conditions, um, a, a strong plant is more likely to produce. So we're going to support our veggies, flowers, and herbs through. Uh, uh, the entire warm season and or at least give them the chance to, to make a yield before it gets to be so terrible. And there are five general categories of things that can help plants the most. Um, and you can think about it as five steps or five, uh, five um, uh, 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 items that you're going to think about to care for your garden. The first one is where to put your plants, where to have your raised bed, where to dig your in-ground in garden, where to have your containers, all of those things apply. So when we think about where to grow, it's the sun exposure uh, that, that we have to think about. Um, a garden, a vegetable garden does not work in the shade. So we want to think about the sun exposure. We're going to get into all the details under all these categories. The second one is to, to get your soil ready and to especially get your soil ready to be able to deliver the nutrients that your plant demands. Um, think about grouping your uh, uh, plants by um, what makes them compatible. Do they have the same nutrient demands or perhaps symbiotic? Uh, what kind of watering 
uh, demands do they have? What kind of room do they have? And maybe the days before you get your yield. Uh, you're going to water your garden deeply. And that may seem like a no-brainer. You may think, I know, I, I, I'm watering. I'm watering appropriately, but we're going to talk a little bit about the technique of watering that will make a huge difference in your garden. And in the warm season, um, vegetable gardens, mulch is just an absolute necessity. You know, other times of year when it's cooler and, you know, we don't have to worry so much about keeping things mulched in the warm season, you have to have it. Um, again, it's one of those things that makes a huge difference. And a couple of other things to think about. So um, uh, when you're when you're trying to figure out what you want to grow, I, not only what you like to eat, but I want you to also think about um, the characteristics of the various crops. And then um, the, we're going to also think about what steps we can take to avoid um, some of the most common problems. Okay, where to grow? Gosh, this is where we begin. We begin with the sweet spot for vegetable gardens for the warm season, and it really does matter a lot. It's the difference between a garden that is um, yields a pretty good amount versus one that is very happy and uh, highly productive. So gar vegetable gardens have to have sun. We're not going to tuck our our pots or to put our raised bed under the shade of a, a large tree. Um, we're not going to tuck it uh, uh, where it doesn't, uh, where it, it's blocked so it doesn't uh, get sun for very much of the day. Some people who are new to the area think, oh, you poor thing, you, you poor um, uh, 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 garden, you, 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 you're just getting blasted by the sun and um, I'll, I'll move you out of the sun. Vegetables have to have sun to grow properly and uh, to get uh, to the point of, of uh, producing harvestable crops. So where in terms of the positioning of the sun exposure? So think about the east facing side of your, your house, your property. Um, the place that gets morning light and then maybe it, once the sun uh, uh, has passed uh, noon and it's early afternoon, and then that area is maybe in the shade. That's an ideal place because morning light is, uh, the temperatures are lower, um, and uh, the, the angle of light is very pleasant for plants. They can do uh, all their photosynthesis before the air temperature is scorching. Um, and then once the sun um, is in its afternoon position, then it can continue to function and be met metabolically happy, but not under that glare of intense sun. So that's east facing. Uh, some of you may only have the opportunity to garden on the south side or on the western side of your property. And these will work, but I want you to think about additional protective measures and keeping an eye on things, looking out for sun scorch, um, looking out for um, uh, uh, leaves uh, desiccating, or experience, experiencing what's called phytotoxicity, where you, um, there might be uh, uh, something on the leaves that then gets magnified by the sun. This actually scorches the leaves. So um, east facing is the sweet spot if you can do that. So where are you going to garden? Are you going to grow everything in containers? Um, containers can be marvelous. Uh, make sure they're deep enough and big enough. Um, minimum 12 inches deep. If you're growing um, a, a, uh, something like a tomato plant, and many, many people love to grow tomatoes, you need a much deeper pot because we plant tomatoes deeply in the soil so that they will uh, develop uh, a very large root mass and uh, uh, put up with the intense heat of summer. So I would say if you have tomatoes, a five gallon volume pot minimum, if you can go bigger, your plant is going to be much, much happier. And make sure your container drains and you can relocate it. And that um, keep in mind that whether it's made of metal or um, uh, clay or, or, or um, uh, plastic, it's going to affect the, the soil temperature. Generally, plastic um, pots are, um, uh, the soil tends to be 
less hot than those made of metal, but it's a continuum. But whatever the pot, whatever your containers are made out of, every container runs hotter and drier. And what does that mean? It means that we have to water more frequently. Um, and there's also one uh, additional disadvantage uh, for using containers and that when you're choosing what to grow, you really do need to grow something that is compact. Um, otherwise, you have to, if you're growing a rampant vine, many tomato varieties are rampant vines, then you need to make uh, accommodations for the plants as they sprout and grow and fountain and take off. And you don't want it to uh, uh, just fountain all over whatever may be uh, growing next to um, your large vining plant. Uh, if you are going to grow something uh, that's a bigger plant, then um, make accommodations for it. Give it um, something else to climb on, um, uh, allow it to sprawl on the ground. Just uh, make sure you have room when you are uh, growing a large variety. So um, uh, in-ground gardens require work. They require opening up the soil and adding a very large amount of organic matter every time uh, be, uh, before every season. The temperatures are, are uh, a little bit more moderate uh, in an in-ground garden. That makes a lot of sense. Um, raised beds are sort of the little bit of both. They have the uh, element of being able to control, uh, control the soil that you put in and generally have marvelous drainage because you've put well-draining soil in the raised beds. Of course, there is a cost of buying them or having them built. Um, and um, uh, Wherever you're growing, whether it's a raised bed, in ground, or um, um, a, a container, the, the material that you are adding, the soil material, must have uh, high organic matter. We're going to get to a little bit more of discussion about that later. So one other thing about where, and that's your garden, your yard, your property, is, is a thing unto itself. It is a unique growing environment. So we need to be out there and see what it's like um, to monitor the conditions and think about anticipating the measures to mitigate the extreme experiences that we're giving our gardens. And uh, so I'm going to give you two examples of, of uh, an area that might require additional mitigation, and that is uh, an unblocked southern or western exposure. And in the spring, we can have very high winds. And then, of course, in the summer when the monsoon comes, it's extremely windy. Um, and then any wall, and many of us are gardening in areas where there's a block wall. But any wall, and especially a wall that faces south or west, is much, much warmer. So we have to think about these uh, conditions where we're putting our vegetable plants. There's reflected heat from block walls. And um, it's very difficult to mitigate against that. You could try maybe growing a vine of something else up along the wall to um, uh, absorb some of that, that heat and block some of the heat from your vegetable garden that might be growing in front of it. So the sun exposure, and boy, <clears throat> uh, sometimes the summer days feel like you are on the face of the sun. It really is hot. So um, the pictures here show what um, uh, the picture on the left is uh, bell pepper, and it shows what um, sunburn looks like on a bell pepper. It is sort of leathery, papery, sometimes yellowish or whitish, um, and this is just damage from the sun on the fruit. So how do we try to uh, avoid that? Because you've gone to the trouble of growing this nice pepper plant, and yet your fruit uh, is damaged. So um, the picture on the right shows a bit more of a canopy of leaves that protect the fruit. And so uh, try to, um, uh, uh, this is one way that we, by providing the right amount of nutrients to a plant, it will grow a very nice canopy, then develop fruit that develops underneath the canopy of these leaves. So uh, some people are really into sort of pruning uh, especially for tomatoes, I would say prune minimally, only if you absolutely must. Leave the canopy. Not only uh, uh, you're maximizing the photosynthetic opportunities for plants, but a canopy in summer is absolutely essential. And of course, uh, uh, shade cloth, which we're going to talk about later on. Oh, so here we go. And shade cloth 
um, is, is a must for growing the crops that are sensitive, and peppers is one of those. So shade cloth comes in different um, percentages in terms of the amount of solar radiation that it blocks. For vegetable gardens, you want 50% shade cloth. And in this system, this is not a picture from my garden. Uh, in this system, it uses a PV, lengths of PVC. But I want you to notice in this picture, there's um, some uh, uh, headroom, if you will, over the plants before the PVC is installed. And that's really important because you want to have ventilation. So you're creating a canopy to reduce the air temperature around the plants and the soil temperature where the roots are growing. And to maintain good ventilation is really important. Do not just lay shade cloth on top of your plants. Um, there, are, there are so many um, uh, materials choices that you have out there, and these are just, just a, the, a beginning. So you can buy um, nine gauge wire that comes in, um, uh, uh, it, it comes in a, a, just a round, uh, um, uh, uh, I guess a, a just length, it's all, it's all rounded up. You'll have to cut it with a wire cutter, um, but then you just push the ends right into the ground. The PVC, which was in the previous picture, but I would recommend tapping a piece of rebar into the soil and placing the PVC over the rebar that will make it much more secure. You can use rebar similarly, but use EMT, which is electrical conduit, and that is very sturdy. A simple system of wooden stakes or T-posts or some other fencing materials um, just make sure that it is sturdy enough. Don't just tap it into the first couple of inches of soil. Make it sturdy to withstand the wind. And the monsoon winds are intense, and um, uh, you don't want to be chasing uh, your your shade cloth system down uh, the street. One other uh, a technique to think about for shade is to grow shade along with your uh, uh, your crops that need shade. So in this system, we have tomatoes going over on the left side, and you can see that they're staked up off the ground. And then we have some very tall sunflowers, and finding uh, tall sunflowers uh, by, uh, from seed is very easy to find. Um, these sunflowers are growing to the south and west of this tomato crop, and tomatoes are one of the crops that absolutely needs shade, uh, some kind of protection from afternoon sun. So you want to grow shade south and west to the crop that needs protection. So here we've talked about tomatoes and peppers, and eggplant would be another um, uh, crop that um, uh, definitely uh, produces much uh, happier uh, foliage and much higher quality fruit given uh, shade protection. So um, the, the sun lovers are listed there um, and uh, uh, enjoy. One, one thought, see at the very bottom I've listed basil. This is basil that you've grown yourself from seed or a tiny plant. If you buy a basil plant um, uh, at the store or um, um, from some other um, uh, perhaps it was grown um, uh, out of state, and if you put your basil plant in, say in uh, April or May or even June, that plant is not acclimated to desert conditions. So I would say if you are going to have a, 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 some basil growing, grow your own so it gets acclimated before the intense heat comes. If you are growing from a plant, then put it in a place where it, it'll be protected. So healthy soil. you know. These vegetables absolutely require very fertile soil, and our native desert soil is very low fertility, and it's alkaline, and it has low organic matter, and this is hostile, uh, 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 unproductive growing conditions. So we have to amend our soil. We want it also to be well-draining and loose and uh, have a neutral pH so that our plants can absorb the nutrients that we put in the soil. And how do we provide these conditions for our vegetable gardens and it's organic matter. It's absolutely key. You really can't have a vegetable garden without it. By the way, for this class, we're talking about growing in soil. It, there's an entirely different um, set of, uh, of growing uh, methodologies using hydroponics or aquaponics, but we're not talking about that now. We're talking about growing in the dirt. So if you're using dirt to grow, then you have to add organic matter to your soil. And so um, it's aged manure. Do not put uncomposted manure anywhere near your vegetable garden. Um, 
only the well-aged stuff or compost, or you will have grown a cover crop, which is a, a crop that is grown not for a yield, but to uh, nutrify or to enrich uh, the soil. So compost, it's absolutely a necessity. It has biological functions inside our soil as well as textural because uh, you know we want to help the soil regulate itself to be able to drain excess water but hold on to enough water so that the roots uh, are able to absorb it. Um, don't step on your uh, your garden with your feet. Make a walkway, make designated walkways and keep them there. We want air passages inside our soil. This is the definition of healthy soil. High, my, lots of microbial diversity and activity, so compost. And we're going to add six inches. If you have an area where that maybe you've had some gardening in the past, or maybe the person before you might have gardened, then definitely go all out for six inches of, of organic matter before planting. You can make your own and save a bundle of money. Um, and I mentioned a cover crop, and we're really not going to get into very many details about that. But if you are going to do that, then make sure you grow it early enough so it has a chance to fully decompose before putting your next crop in. So if you're doing an in-ground garden, you need to open up that soil and moisten it. Try to work vertically, like with a fork, rather than horizontally with a shovel. And if you're using containers, make sure that potting soil is high enough quality and um, you can add more compost to that as well. And you can also, don't necessarily feel like you have to put rocks at the bottom for drainage. Use some pine cones or pine straw. So we're going to give our vegetable gardens the nutrients they need. And the nutrients are the um, most, uh, uh, the, I guess, highest demand of nutrients are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. But I want you to know the fertility requirements of the plants you want to grow, and then add the nutrients that the plant demands. And um, uh, most of the, these crops for the warm season remind, demand high soil fertility. So unless you're growing just beans and beans only, you will need to add fertilizer. Beans, uh, with their um, relationship um, with uh, uh, microbes in the soil, uh, have their own source of nitrogen. So there's no need to add nitrogen. So um, nitrogen and phosphorus are the two nutrients our gardens need the most. Um, nitrogen disappears, so it must be replenished. And every time we put water on our soil, the nitrogen goes into solution and it runs away. Another reason not to overwater, right? But if you're, when you're adding uh, a phosphate, it has to be down at the, where the roots can absorb it. Uh, it doesn't go into solution very easily. And so when you're working your nutrients into your soil, make sure you put it, you mix it in well. And what type of fertilizer do I want you to use? Well, when you're looking at the, uh, the nutrient analysis on the package, uh, make sure you choose one that has either equal nitrogen and phosphorus or with phosphorus in higher concentration than nitrogen. This is really important, especially for something like tomatoes. Um, many people put, just put nitrogen, and that's great for nice, lush green growth, but that does not support the development of flowers. So that's what phosphorus does, in addition to a bunch of other things. But there has to be adequate uh, phosphorus for um, our, our flowering plants to make flowers. So whatever fertilizer you choose to use, whether it's organic or a, uh, a synthetic chemical, follow every instruction on the package. Do not dump it in. Do not just scoop it and pour it. Uh, do the math and figure out how much the package will tell you for the area that you are uh, cultivating. Don't estimate. Don't dump. And I promise more is not better. It's very harmful, not only for the environment, but for it, it, you may overdo it and it, uh, uh, for your plants as well. So I am going to uh, uh, take a quick pause here, and um, we're just going to stop briefly. We're going to see what kind of questions have come in before we continue, and we don't really have a, a whole huge, a whole amount, huge of amount of time left. Thank you, Emily. Very great start to the workshop. We've had a few questions. Um, Louise sent in a question that is more about the watering, and I know that's going to come up in the second half, so yeah. we might come yeah. back to that question. And then there's also a question about wood mulch, which is also uh, in the second half, so we'll come back to that. Okay. But there is a question from Dale about what depth do we measure soil temperature? 
Okay, that's, that's a really that's great question. question. Um, uh, I would say I would put put, um, put your thermometer in where the seed is going to go. And most seeds uh, are planted at the upper horizon of the soil, and um, um, certainly within the the, the, top, the top inch, inch or, two. or two. So you know you don't you need know, to, probe to probe deeply, deeply to take to a take temperature. temperature. Just to the upper horizon of the soil is fine. Excellent. We have one more question that we have time for. Can you still eat sunburnt fruit? Well, sure. What I would recommend doing is maybe um, carving off the the part that is leathery and and uh, scalded. I wouldn't actually eat the scalded part, but the rest of the in the picture that we saw the pepper, probably the rest of that pepper would be fine. Thank you. That's, an, I think, all we have time for for now, um, but we'll come back to Q&A at the very end. So keep those questions coming. Okay, so um, let's talk just very briefly about grouping strategies, because when I, I want your garden to have, be, uh, have a very high diversity of plants. I want you to have plants from different plant families. I want you to have herbs. And I want you to have flowers because a diverse garden is a very healthy garden. So we have to think about how are we going to group. Um, combine plants that have similar demands or conditions. In other words, if you were if you were thinking about grouping, would okra and tomato be nice together? Probably not because tomato needs shade and okra does not need any shade. So um, uh, think about uh, the, the conditions and the needs uh, that plants have when, when you're uh, combining them. Um, make sure you are giving your plants enough room when you're making these combinations. So how do we know? Every seed package or certainly every plant tag should tell you what the height, the, the, the mature height and width and the growth habit for every single thing you want to grow. And I, ideally the time uh, to uh, maturity. If plants are all smushed together too much, you're going to uh, create an opportunity for disease and pests to hide. And this uh, this is a, a form of stress. And our warm season plants already are under enough stress. And we don't want to under undermine their um, the chance that we're going to um, uh, we're going to get a yield. So there is a time honored plant grouping that you could uh, uh, that you can put right to work in your garden. It works so well and it's actually really attractive. Um, these are not my pictures, but they really illustrate the combination of corn, beans, and squash. And many people uh, uh, follow this method. It's called the three sisters for a reason. Um, each uh, plant um, supports the other in, in the growth and function. And it's uh, if you have room and you're in a southern exposure, and you can't have, uh, you don't have any room on the eastern side, then put this guy in full sun. Uh, the, the corn, and you can use sunflowers for an upright as well. Uh, the beans um, uh, and the squash all function beautifully together. Do a three sisters garden. So let's get into watering. And so uh, vegetable gardens need to be watered to a depth of 12 inches. Um, and uh, watering deeply is the difference between a pretty good garden and a wow garden. We know that overwatering uh, is not good for our garden. I'm not suggesting that you turn your garden into a swamp. I'm suggesting that you use a drip irrigation system that will deliver water slowly so it percolates down to the roots. So overwatering, we know, uses too much water and it also might kill your plant because it takes away their oxygen and it facilitates uh, disease. So I want you to really kind of think about watering in a new way. As it gets hotter and hotter and hotter, the amount of water you put uh, uh, on your garden doesn't necessarily change. What changes is the frequency with which you're going to be watering. And really, what does that mean? That means that the intervals in between watering is the one thing that shifts and changes depending upon the conditions and, of course, depending upon the calendar. 
And in this, um, on this slide, you're going to see over, and this is for the entire year. And I've put the warm season months in bold, where it says March to May, 3 to 7, and then May to October, 2 to 5. And what does that mean? That means that we could be watering our gardens anywhere from between every three days to every seven days during the time frame from March to May. Three to seven days is a pretty long interval, isn't it? So how do we know whether it's three? four, five, six, or seven. Same thing applies in May and October. The interval of two, three, four, or five days, that's a wide variety. And this is because the conditions are different. This is one of the things that requires our attention, not just monitoring the weather and the conditions, but monitoring the soil, the, the moisture in your soil. And how do we do this? We probe the soil. If your Three Sisters garden looks kind of wilty, especially the squash leaves are wilting in the heat of the day, you may think, oh, you poor deer, you need water. Well, squash is one of those plants that sort of does a fake out. The leaves often will wilt in the heat of the day. And then once the sun gets off the garden, then they'll respond. Then they'll come right back up and recover. So using wilt as the sign, as the decision of whether to water or not is inadequate. Use a soil probe to determine when the root zone needs water. And what do I mean by a probe? You can purchase a moisture meter that has a sensor on it. The sensors do kind of wear out over time. You can use a basic chopstick, a, 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 a metal skewer or some kind of barbecue skewer, a very thin a dowel or a metal rod or your hand put using your finger. You water again once the soil is dry down to several inches. Remember, the last time you watered, you watered all the way down to uh, 12 inches, and that means you watered to where the roots can absorb it. So we don't care what the top of the soil looks like. Probe the soil. Stick something in there. Get some practice with this. You will be able to sense where the moisture begins and ends in your soil. And having loose um, aerated soil makes this much, much easier. So we don't use our eyes to determine whether to run the irrigation or to use uh, our hoses to water our vegetable gardens. We use the information from probing our soil. So one other thing about watering, and that is if you're growing from seed, seed beds require even moisture, uh, like a squeezed out sponge. But once you get germination and we have little baby plants that have maybe one or two sets of leaves, that is when you change watering to watering to 12 inches. Don't continue to do surface watering. This is actually very harmful for your plants uh, for multiple reasons. And you're actually harming your soil by surface watering. You're concentrating salt and vegetable crops will not yield if they are salty. So every, every uh, uh, one of these crops needs organic mulch. You can use um, straw, chopped leaves. Um, I think there was a question about uh, wood mulch. Um, that is not my favorite uh, mulch for our vegetable gardens, but it definitely works. The smaller the pieces, the better. So we have to mulch to reduce the temperature of the soil and of course to slow evaporation. Um, we're going to suppress weeds. It prevents soil from splashing back up on the plants. Uh, and water from uh, splashing back up there as well, and we have a, a, a prevention of erosion. Mulch mimics mother nature. Look at this tiny seedling. Um, this is a cutaway plant with a bunch of leaves on there as acting as a natural mulch. Boy, that plant is not very impressive looking. Look at how much the roots have established. This is protection from mulch. So you are going to mimic mother nature by uh, installing uh, uh, several inches of mulch over your plant. This is not my picture, but it shows mulch pretty well. We have vegetable, we have uh, tomato plants in cages. Look at the mulch all around, but notice there's um, the mulch is pulled back from the stem, the main stem of the plant. This is important. And you are going to be growing real flowers, not just pinwheel fake flowers. One other thing about mulch. Your irrigation lines, if you have drip irrigation, go below the mulch. There's no need to water the mulch. Um, so when you're installing your garden, you put your plants in, you do your irrigation, and then you mulch on top of that. 
and keep that mulch away from the main stems. So uh, the the crop characteristics for low desert gardening are so important. We've already talked about early. Some varieties are known to be heat tolerant, and that's great. By the way, heat tolerant and drought tolerant are not the same thing. Look for heat tolerant in the description, or even disease resistant. But primarily choose one that will fit in the area that you are going to be growing and that will fit with the other plants that you want to grow as well. And for following instructions on the seed package or on the plant tag for how deep to plant, and generally speaking, the tinier the seed, the more shallow it's planted. Uh, the, and as the seeds grow in size, you go down into a little bit of depth. Uh, but follow those instructions for depth, for spacing between the plants, and spacing between the rows of those plants. And when you're shopping for transplants, don't get the one that looks like a supermodel, like super tall and very leggy, which means long, super, uh, super long stems. Choose one that sort of looks like um, a weightlifter. It's sturdy and stocky. These are plants that are more accustomed to proper sun. Leggy plants are, uh, oftentimes were grown in sort of false conditions, maybe just grow light um, or maybe greenhouses where light was inadequate. Your plants are going to go in a place where there's lots of sun. So choose a sturdy plant that will be happy in a lots of sun environment. So every garden has bugs and let's not worry about them as much. And growing super strong, healthy plants is the best way for your plants to um, uh, mount a defense against a, a bug attack. Insect netting um, is available and I would strongly recommend using that. And when you're going to use it, you're going to install it right at the time of planting. Don't wait until you have a bug problem because then you're, all you're doing is tucking all the bugs in right around your plants. Uh, tool, T-U-L-L-E, which is bridal veil material, is fairly inexpensive and you can get it anywhere where fabric is sold. Please resist the urge to spray, even organic sprays. Um, this creates an imbalance and all the uh, bug um, and crawling uh, and flying um, populations out there. And um, we need uh, Mother Nature to help us regulate that. And that is beneficial insects. And how do we get beneficial insects? Offer sources of nectar and pollen. And this means flowers. I want to show you a couple pictures of some friends, um, your friends that are waiting to help you eat uh, the uh, the bugs that cause problems in your garden. This is called an assassin bug. Uh, he's normally quite visible on the leaves. Um, he is backed in to uh, the cup of the leaf and chomping um, um, other bugs that might arrive. Um, uh, this is uh, the top predator in your uh, garden, the uh, praying mantis you see on the left. And he is a wonderful hunter as well. Um, the picture on the right is what the egg casing looks like. And if you refrain from spraying uh, over many seasons and these guys uh, arrive at your garden, then they will reproduce, which is what you want. You want to have a reproducing population of beneficial insects. And the picture on the right is the egg casing. It kind of looks like a frosted mini wheat. Um, and uh, uh, leave those. That is next season's uh, uh, a population of mantids. And don't let this picture give you the willies. It's a wolf spider mama with all of the babies on her back. Every spider in your garden is your friend. Uh, let them reproduce. Let them crawl around. Um, encourage them to uh, be as busy as they possibly can. Every spider eats other bugs. If bugs, when bugs come, oftentimes just spraying some water will uh, knock down the populations. Um, uh, if you choose to use an insecticide, be informed and follow exactly what the packages will tell you. Begin with a product that is the least damaging to a beneficial insects. Um, don't just randomly spray something. Uh, inf be informed. Uh, I've already mentioned crop rotation, and um, uh, uh, it's one of the uh, more advanced things to think about. But if you are a beginner, you can keep track of what you're growing where and then just shift gears into other families uh, to help you keep your soil and your garden as healthy as, uh, as healthy as possible. So pull those weeds, that is a no-brainer. One weed has um, so many seeds, so 
Pull them up when they're green, before they make flowers, and certainly before they reproduce. By the way, weeds harbor pests. Did you know that? Get rid of the weeds. And I want to show you very quickly some maybe some less well-known crops that do so well here in the low desert. Lab Lab um, is a wonderful vining bean. Uh, the flowers are absolutely delicious in your salad. This is a very heat tolerant plant. You can let it sprawl on the ground. You can let it vine uh, on a fence. You can let it uh, crawl up and over something else. Those beautiful purple pods are fabulous, but please don't eat those. They're edible, but you have to know how to prepare them. Moringa, many people are growing moringa now for the um, health benefits of the entire plant, leaves, flowers, beans. It grows great here. It needs warm weather. Uh, there are some heat tolerant greens that you can grow. This is, um, um, it's called New Zealand spinach. It's really not a spinach, but it has similar eating qualities. Uh, this is also a, another similar spinach. This is a vining plant, really attractive. Look how pretty those flowers are. Uh, there is a red stemmed version, that Bacella rubra, the one on the right. Uh, and the leaves are kind of crunchy. Um, you wouldn't want to have a whole salad with the with this uh, uh, leaf, but it's a great thing to toss into a salad or maybe put on um, uh, a sandwich, but maybe um, uh, having a salad with some other greens. This is a plant that may be growing uh, wild in your in your uh, on your property somewhere. Um, it is very high in omega three fatty acids. It has kind of a lemony tart taste. You can chop up. Um, you use the, the, the smaller stems, they're sort of more tender. You wouldn't want, again, to eat a whole bowl of it, but it's a great salad green. And, and um, uh, the Spanish name for this crop is verdolagas, and it is, you can buy seeds for it, um, uh, and uh, it's wonderfully heat tolerant. Another heat tolerant green, amaranth, you put the young greens in your salad. The larger leaves are, are, are not as tasty. It, what a pretty plant, too. Here's another green. This is Egyptian spinach. It's not spinach, but it has a similar taste. It is amazingly heat tolerant. It's an attractive little plant, pretty little yellow flowers. Just a pinch off a few, a handful of leaves to toss into your salad. Again, you wouldn't want to eat a whole bowl of it. And sesame, this is so much fun. It might be fun to do this with your kids. It's, it makes a pretty tall plant. Uh, and you can see the a picture on the upper left it makes a, a pretty little flower. And then you get pollination and these lovely green um, um, little capsules, and as they dry, they dry, uh, brown and open up, and the sesame seeds are inside. How fun. This is another food plant, uh, Hibiscus sabdurifa. Uh, this is, um, we use the calyx to make absolutely delicious tea. We plant in March and then begin uh, harvesting in the, in the fall. It's a very long uh, growing plant. Um, and then lemongrass loves, absolutely loves full sun. Uh, and it, you can see the clump there. One piece of lemongrass planted with roots on it can fill an area that's two or three feet across given um, enough hours of sun and regular water. But you don't have to put a huge amount of water on it. It does great. Don't forget to enjoy yourself. Don't worry so much about what might seem to have not worked as well or maybe imperfections. Every garden has joy in it. And seek it and the lessons that you learned. And it's a really terrific adventure. And I'm so grateful to you for uh, participating today. By the way, that ladybug, ladybugs are fabulous in the garden, not just to let them crawl around on you, but uh, they eat aphids. They're um, the, uh, the baby, uh, uh, their next generation loves to attack aphids. So um, uh, uh, let ladybugs come. And um, uh, how do we, uh, I want to emphasize this, how do we let ladybugs uh, and other beneficials um, uh, be in our gardens? By not spraying and by offering nectar and pollen. It's really as simple as that. And other sources and references for you to, uh, to use, uh, I want to emphasize the um, uh, U Arizona Cooperative Extension website. It is phenomenal. It is wonderful. New documents are added all the time. Added all the time. And it's so worthwhile. So Thank you so much. Much. Thank you so much, Emily. That was so informative. We have such great questions that we're going to come back to 
at the Q&A at the very end. Wanted to highlight quickly that we have a survey. Um, I know your time is precious and we have a survey that's linked in the Q&A in case uh, you can't stay until the very end in 15 minutes. Um, I think one of the biggest values of a presentation like this, even though it's so quick, is that Emily has shared these research based resources that can give you those next steps for your particular situation. So I encourage you to look at the, the handout that Emily has sent. It was attached to all the video email reminders um, as well as posted to the announcement and I'll post it once again during the Q&A. Um, very quickly I wanted to make sure you were aware of all the uh, various water conservation resources available to you to help support your landscape dreams and your gardening dreams. We have the water smart portal at tempe.gov slash water smart where you can examine your water usage. You can look for tips. You can uh, see updates for upcoming programs that we have signed up for leak alert so you can manage your water usage and have more of that water to support your beautiful garden we have digital resources including the conservation resource library we have a couple questions that have come in about how to get access to these amazing slides and resources emily has shared um, so that is a, a place to go um, within the next week we'll actually post this video in case you've missed any part of it. Um, all of our workshops are also on that um, that video um, library, as well as just articles and links to cooperative extension and 100 plus ways to conserve water and landscape watering tips for the rest of your landscape. Some of the upcoming classes we have as well. Um, when you come live, you have the opportunity to submit questions and get that live experience. We have drip irrigation maintenance and repair, common mistakes when planting trees, and you can register the same way you registered for this workshop. We also have rebates. Um, if you decide you're ready to take some other actions, updating the efficiency of your toilets, converting landscape to xeriscape, um, even adding new desert plants to those other areas of your landscape, we have tree bait, um, which despite its name is actually for any desert adapted plant. We have high efficiency irrigation upgrade rebate and a gray water recycling system rebate. Um, and I, uh, I'll reiterate what Emily has said, the Master Gardeners, the Maricopa Cooperative Extension, really great resource. One of the biggest battles is to be able to discern between anecdotal information or information online that's for completely different climate with research based information that is going to work right here in Tempe in your yard. Uh, Master, the Maricopa Master Gardeners have a hotline, a phone number and an email. You can send them pictures of um, plants that aren't doing well and they have at their fingertips and through their training um, information that can help you discern what might be wrong. So again, the survey link is right there. We're gonna, we have lots of time for a Q&A, so we're gonna go ahead and get started there. And I'm gonna show Emily's uh, PowerPoint in case she has pictures that she wants to go back to. Um, so I will start from here. Um, how deep should you have, this is from Dale. Emily, how deep should you have woody mulch? Uh, well, it kind of depends on uh, what we're talking about with woody mulch. I mean, some people think woody mulch is like big chunks of bark. And frankly, I think that type of mulch is fabulous for more of your garden, uh, your landscape beds. Um, this, uh, the m more refined pieces, it's, it's just better for your, uh, uh, for your vegetable for garden. Vegetable garden. And, um, uh, you know, I think, I think Six inches on top of our soil is 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 the amount that we're looking for. So we don't want to bury our plants, though. And I, I think when when you're dealing with big chunky pieces, it's maybe from a material standpoint kind of harder to work with. So that's why I like working with kind of crunched up leaves. Um, I like pine needles also and um, uh, and a material that is you can like grab a handful of and uh, or uh, a uh, using gloves, you know, kind of arm, an arm, you know, two hands lifting together to place. And um, so uh, I would say, you know, six inches is really best. Um, and that may seem like a very thick layer, but we are insulating against temperatures that 
uh, are are very outside of the of the normal range of functioning for a lot of these plants. And so by keeping moisture in and keeping more moderate temperature in, we're gonna uh, we're gonna see fewer impacts from the, that intense heat. So I would say shoot for six inches. You know, if you only have access to a, a, a uh, the kind of the material, kind of material that, that is more is like more like you know three or four inches, that that's okay. You know, um, you know, put put a good amount of mulch down, and six inches is is the recommended amount. Um, you know, I wouldn't skimp on it. But, um, uh, you know, can you overdo it? Well, sure. <laughs> but, uh, you know, shoot for basically if you're grabbing material like with two hands together and then placing it down, then that's it tends to be about the right amount. Thank you, Emily. Uh, along the lines of wood mulch, um, someone submitted my wood mulch did not work in my garden. The feral cat um, looked like they they defecate um, and urinate all over it and the plants die. What else can I use? Thank you. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> feral cats can be a really uh, a difficult a challenge because uh, they're, you know, you can't really control them. So I would, uh, first of all, I wouldn't assume that it was the, the, um, the cat uh, defecating and whatever on the plant that caused it to die. I, um, it may have been a contributing factor, but we don't know for sure whether uh, that actually caused the death of the plant. I really like using crunched up leaves, and I also like using um, pine needles. But in my garden, I have access, I have both uh, ficus trees, which produce a huge amount of leaves, and pine trees, which produces lots of pine straw. So if I didn't have either one of those readily available, um, you can get a bale of of uh, straw at one of the um, agriculture, uh, uh, the um, you know the the feed store or uh, um, uh, 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 the uh, a lot of the veterinary stores have bales of of uh, of straw as well. Um, hay usually has uh, 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 seeds in it, seeds from that grass material. So you want to get straw. And then, of course, once you get it home, you'll have to open up the the things that are holding the bales together, and then you know pull it apart. And it it, it takes some doing, um, but um, I would say straw would be uh, the the next best thing. It makes a pretty good little mess. So you know, um, uh, get an old sheet or a, uh, an old beach towel or an old um, uh, uh, large piece of cloth to put the thing on, and then as you're deconstructing it, taking it apart in order to put it on your garden, then you know you can uh, you can control the mess that way. But I would say straw. Um, one thing with with uh, straw, um, uh, some people are concerned with uh, herbicide um, uh, carryover, meaning herbicides were uh, sprayed on the plants to you know to 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 uh, make them cuttable for hay and straw so where you're purchasing it you can inquire if it uh, if it's been sprayed uh, with an herbicide um, but uh, I think finding organic straw might be a little challenging but um, if you're up for a challenge then uh, go for it I have used all of those materials by the way straw pine needles green pine needles excuse me um, brown pine needles that have fallen from the tree as well as crunched up leaves and you don't have to crunch leaves to a powder just again so that they're not uh, so that they're like pick up a bowl and you can place them um, place them in your garden using a big uh, um, a, a trash barrel uh, a plastic trash barrel to move these materials around uh, and a rake is basically how you are um, uh, manipulating and relocating these materials it makes a big mess and you know you need long sleeves and gloves and you know, some kind of protection, um, but um, it's it's really, really important. Get your kids to help you. They don't mind throwing the <laughs> around. And around and Thanks, Emily. Um, we have uh, several other questions. So I have more success when I buy small transplant veggies. The pots will hold shape when moved to the garden. But when I grow from seed to get an early start, the soil in the pot, pot falls apart and can damage roots. How do I get the soil to hold together and have good roots like those from stores to transfer to the garden? 
successfully? That's a great question. That's a great question. And that is that, so when, when we have a, a, a um, those little, um, I think our questioner is talking about those little pulpy pot thingies uh, or the little, um, uh, the little, I guess, little soil clumps that um, we we grow. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think that for the, the soil in those little um, uh, uh, shapes to be moist enough to hold together, and basically, you know, it's holding it together roots. So what you, your experience may be that there was maybe inadequate uh, root development of of those um, of those plants. You know, when when I'm talking about growing from seed, you absolutely can grow your own transplant. But um, uh, right now, you don't have to take that step. You can just put the seeds right in the soil, not for the the yet for the uh, crops that love the the hottest weather, like okra and sweet potatoes, like we talked about. But for beans, squash, and all that, we can plant those right now. And you can grow a transplant. It's totally fine. But I look at it from the standpoint of, do I have to grow a transplant when I can just, what's called direct seed or direct sow, put those seeds right in the soil that you've prepared that are that is the location where you intend to grow that crop. That I think is really, um, I think that's your best bet because the, the roots haven't, uh, don't undergo any disturbance and uh, they, they kind of settle in into that location with the sun angle and the sun exposure. Uh, I think that's an ideal thing to do. I hope I've answered your question. Thank you, Emily. Um, a few more minutes for questions here. And one is, I am concerned about water use. Are there veggies that use less water? Marvelous question. And you are exactly right to be concerned. Uh, vegetable gardens are very heavy water users. There is a type of bean that is indigenous to the Sonoran Desert it is absolutely delicious, and it will die if you water it uh, at, the, at, the, at the same level that you would water just a regular bean. It's called tepary bean, T as in Tom, E-P-A-R-Y, tepary bean. And uh, the folks at Native Seed Search down in Tucson uh, offer tepary bean seeds. Um, uh, uh, you might even be able to find them elsewhere because not just in Arizona, uh, many places are concerned about a, a, a growing food in a hotter, drier climate. Um, Tabari beans are marvelous to grow. They are low water food producing plants. They're fabulous. And not, I mean, just the flavor is also outstanding. It's a dry bean, meaning you eat it at, at, um, after you have let the beans, the bean pods grow and then the seeds inside dry. Um, not like a green bean, although I've never had a green tepary bean, but it's probably good. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, sadly, most of the other crops that we uh, associate with the warm season, tomato, eggplant, um, are very uh, big water users and corn is a very high water uh, needing plant. And, um, uh, you know, if, if, uh, if you water correctly, meaning if you let water penetrate deeply, and if you're using mulch and uh, shade protection of those crops that, that require it, you will notice that you are using less water uh, for your warm season vegetable garden because you're putting water at the plant's root zone where it can be used, water is not running off, and then the evaporative rate is, is significantly diminished with mulch and then with shade over. So um, uh, thank you for your concern about uh, uh, water use. Um, try uh, these water saving techniques, um, but you can also grow tepary beans. Um, the, uh, the Another thing that you can think about growing is uh, Mediterranean type herbs, which use less water. And remember in the handout under flowers, I list flowers that are uh, don't need as frequent watering. Um, veggies um, uh, are, are thirsty plants, especially 
um, the, the need to give them water, uh, a significant amount of water to compensate all of that water moving that these plants do through their through their tissues, through the roots and stems and leaves to stay cool. <laughs> this is why plants need so much water because they are like pumping water um, intensely, moving moisture through their the leaves and the other plant tissues to keep from desiccating. <laughs> it's it's so true. The air is sucking moisture out of these plants so rapidly. So um, uh, it, it is definitely a harsh environment to grow veggies. But um, uh, try the techniques and uh, uh, probe your soil to see if that frequency, that interval of watering widens just a bit over previous years when you didn't use those techniques like mulch probing and the shade cloth. We really appreciate your time, especially yours, Emily, and all the interest from the attendees. We had about 41 at the height of the workshop and really appreciate those who hung on until the end. Um, we could talk about veggie gardens all day long, um, but I, so we encourage you to continue using those resources. I just posted the link that um, had the handout on it so you can download and um, examine the resources that Emily put together. Um, but thank you so much. It, the video should be posted uh, within a week or so on that website. We have about 13 or 14 other workshops that have been recorded and are also on there. So you can watch those while you're waiting. Have a good and safe rest of your week and thank you everyone.